Well, welcome to Luke in Context. This is our second class of five classes in the summer in July and the first week in August on Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel is 24 glorious chapters of very unique material, which I handed out to you last time uh, that we met, which was last week. And you can get all of the course materials on our Shepherd's Heart Anglican Church website, which is shacfairfax.org. You'll see a, a link to Luke and its context on our homepage, which will take you to the recording from all the previous week's classes, as well as links to the handouts. So all of that's there for you. If we have not met, if you're watching online or just stumbled across us somehow Googling Luke, my name is the Reverend Robbie Pruitt, and I'm here with Shepherd's Heart Anglican Church. I'm the re re rector here. I'm getting used to saying that. We call them pastors in the Baptist church where I grew up. So in the Anglican church, we call us rectors. So just a fancy word for the, the guy in charge. So um, getting used to that and hope you'll get used to it with us here at Shepherd's Heart Anglican Church because we would love to have you either in person or online here at Shepherd's Heart. So let's pray and ask God to reveal himself to us through his word, because the unique thing about the Bible and spiritual things, Paul tells us in Corinthians that it is the spirit of God who helps us understand the things of the spirit, for we cannot understand the things of the spirit unless the spirit of God draws us. So Lord, we pray tonight that you would draw us to yourself, that you would make yourself known through your written word. Thank you for your saint, Luke, who wrote down these accounts to give us an accurate account of the things that you did and taught. So help us to know you more tonight. Draw us closer to you. Illuminate your word and help us to understand the Bible better as well. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Luke is part one of a two-part series by Luke. We talked yesterday, I keep saying yesterday, last week about Luke writing two books. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, but he also wrote Acts, which makes Luke the most prolific author of the New Testament, okay? Which means that if you count up the verses, Luke writes more of the Bible than Paul does. Paul writes more books. Luke writes more content. So Luke began his gospel with, I am writing to you, O excellent Theophilus, about these things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And what we said was that cues us in that Luke understands that many other gospel writers wrote things down, but he's writing things down for a purpose. And so we see all of that in the first four verses of Luke. And what I want to do to begin our class tonight is I want to read the first verses of Luke and then read the parallel sounding passages in the beginning of Acts. So this is Luke. In so much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things concerning Jesus, the things accomplished among us by Jesus, uh, that's how Luke begins. In other words, Luke is saying, I recognize that other people have written about Jesus. So right out the gate, we know Luke has been made aware of other writings and has most likely read them, particularly Mark's gospel. Verse two, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. So now we see that Luke is concerned with eyewitnesses. This is very exciting because uh, we know that Luke wants to give an accurate account from the next few verses, and he does that by actually interviewing eyewitnesses. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything. That's pretty good. Don't you want to hear from somebody who has investigated everything concerning Jesus? So I don't know about you, but that makes me want to read his gospel and understand it more, not less, because he has investigated everything 
from eyewitnesses and he is aware and have probably has probably read the other accounts as well. So that's good news. So those who investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in a consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, or to give an orderly account, your, your version of scripture might say, so that you might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So there's Luke's pur purpose statement, that you might know the exact things that you have been taught, that I might put these things in order or consecutively, and we know he's writing, writing to Theophilus, which means lover of God. So already this sets the stage. Now listen to the parallel passage in Acts. So part two begins with a similar statement. Here is Acts verses one, and let's go on through three. The first account I composed, Theophilus, there's the name again about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Okay, do and teach. Luke is writing about everything that Jesus began to do and teach. The order of the words is important because to a Jewish person, it's not about what you know or what you have learned it's about what you have put into practice. It's about doing first and then teaching. In North America in the 21st century, it's tell me about what you know. Tell me about what Bible class you attended at Tuesday on 7 o'clock p.m., right? Not what did you do, but what have you learned? Not what are you going to do, but what are you going to be learning? There's a big difference there. Until the day when he, meaning Jesus, capital H, was taken up after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To those he presented himself alive after suffering by many convicting proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days after speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So here, Luke is referencing the 40-day post-resurrection appearance, appearances by Jesus. And because Luke has a unique account of the resurrection from the road to Emmaus, we think that maybe Luke interviewed those guys, or at least one of them. Remember the Emmaus road account of the resurrection? Luke citing these resurrection appearances and the 40 days post-resurrection in his part two in Acts. So Luke is giving an eyewitness account. Tonight, we want to look at what eyewitness account Luke is looking at. So tonight, we want to look at the case for context. So Maria and those of you who are online, again, go to shacfairfax.org. Click the Luke button in the middle for this class. It'll take you to this class's homepage. Scroll down till you see the last three buttons are the three handouts for tonight. The first of which is going to be this one, comparing discipleship then and now. It's a one pager and it is two columns. And we're going to look at that. Last week, we looked at Luke. We looked at who Luke was. A position Gentile. We looked at we looked at the Bible and its literary context because Luke is a gospel, a piece of literature in a work of literature, which is sixty six books, thirty nine in the old, twenty seven in the new. Remember that we talked about the different literary genres and contexts, and I gave you a handout where we looked at those. And we place Luke in it. Okay. Tonight, we want to look more at that meta narrative and the historical 
religious context of Luke. So we looked at Luke, the author. Now we're going to look at Luke in context. So we got to look at the context piece. And then we're going to put it together kind of like we did in last week's class with talking about John the Baptist's teaching to the Gentiles and how that was unique to Luke. Remember that? If you were here last week, we talked about the contextual clues that makes what he said to these people radical. So we're going to take another couple of these unique accounts of Luke, and we're going to put together Luke. We're going to put together the context. Okay? So let's go with that in mind, the do and teach <laughs> in mind. Let's look at the comparing of discipleship then and now. Luke wants us to know everything that Jesus did and taught, and he wants us to know that in that order. Do and teach. These are the things that Jesus did, and these are the things that Jesus taught. So, the world of making disciples then, then being the first century, and now, meaning the 21st century America, is the difference between a Hebrew mindset and a Greek mindset. What do you know about Luke already? What, which mindset is he coming to you from? Hellenistic. Hellenistic or Greek mindset, right? He, he is a Greek thinker. He's a Gentile. But wait, he is also living in a Hebrew world, okay? Just like, for an example, I'm a Southerner living in Northern Virginia. I've got a Southern culture, but I understand where I am. Does that make sense? That's all of us can hold multicultural views, okay? We can all do that. So Luke is a Greek thinker, but he's living in a Hebrew world, especially as he travels with Paul on his missionary journeys and things of that nature. Remember, uh, physicians are servants, and Paul had Luke as his servant, a physician. So the Hebrew way is doing an action. So a a Jewish person would, in, in the first century would never ask somebody, hey, how is, how is uh, Father Ravi's marriage? They wouldn't ask the question. They'd follow him around for a couple of weeks, and then they'd ask the question, answer the question, right? They would never ask because they would want to see it in practice. So the emphasis is not what you think or not what someone says, but what someone does, okay? That is the Hebrew way. The Greek way is thinking, words, ideas, expression. So the Hebrew way is more concrete, realism. The Greek way is more abstract. Again, ideas, abstract thinking. The Jewish way is integrated context is understood. In other words, who are we as a specific people in a specific history? Okay. And to the Greek, most of the biblical context is missing in its historic rootedness. Let me give you an example. And I'm going to pick on a well-known evangelical pastor because he asked for it, okay? All right, in Atlanta, Georgia, there is a well-known megachurch pastor named Andy Stanley. And he, just years ago, he said that Christians just need to abandon the Old Testament because we're people of grace. The Old Testament has no place. And that is so misled and so um, unrooted, you're, you're, you're literally taking your faith and uprooting it. It's like, I think picture like a potted plant. If you want a potted plant to live, the last thing you do is, would be pull it up and put it somewhere different or pull it out of its roots, okay? You would never do that. Our Christian faith is rooted in Judaism. 
Jesus was Jewish. Je matter of fact, Jesus was a Jewish Pharisee. Jesus was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law. I'm just going to leave that there and now think about all the harsh words Jesus had for Pharisees. Okay? Why was he, why did he have all of these harsh words for Pharisees? Because that's his tribe. And if anyone would know how far off the mark they were, it would be him. And if anyone felt they had license to speak out against them, it would be him. Right? Says the man who says a prophet is not without honor except for in his own hometown. Right? So it's important that we see the Jewishness of our faith because that's how Jesus saw it. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than any other book of the Bible, specifically in Luke. He quotes Deuteronomy. So he's rooted in his Old Testament. He has it memorized. So we can't divorce or divide the Old and New Testament. So I said it this way last week. It's not about the Old Testament. It's not about the New Testament. It's about the whole Testament. Is tell, telling one singular narrative of the story of God, which is why Luke, a Gentile, does not jettison the Jewish worldview when he writes his gospel. Does he emphasize the gospel being for Gentiles and the riffraff, the outcast? Yes. Does he take it from its Jewish roots? No. And it's essential that we know that. So now I just want to outline the Bible for you. And that's going to be on last week's handout. I'm going to outline the Bible for you. It's going to be on last week's handout. This is last week's handout. There are three orbs here that tells you the literary context. Page two at the bottom has a paragraph. And that's where I'm drawing from now. The Bible is a library of books. It is it a book? Yes. It's also a library of books. The Bible is telling one singular story, God's story. It can be outlined in these four storylines. The four storylines of the Bible are creation, fall, rescue, and restoration. Again, the Bible is about creation, fall, rescue, and restoration. Both the Old and the New Testament are telling one story, one singular narrative about God's relationship with his people. The Bible is answering five worldview questions that every religion, every philosophy and every person is asking at some point in their lives. And if you haven't asked these five questions, you will. Here they are. Where did I come from? That is a creation question. Why is there such a mess in the world? That is a fall question. Is there any hope? That is a rescue question. What am I here for? I believe that that is also a creation question. It's also a rescue question because our purpose needs to be rescued. And it's a restoration question. Our purpose needs to be restored. Number five, what happens to me when I die? That is a restoration question. Okay? Four storylines of scripture. Creation, fall, rescue, restoration answering five worldview questions. Where did I come from? Why is there such a mess in the world? Is there any hope? What am I here for? And what happens to me when I die? You with me? And the Bible answers all four of those questions, five of those questions, and gives it to us in those four worldview, in those four storylines of scripture. Back to Luke. He understands this historical context of God and his people. He does not take the word of God 
out of its rootedness of God's people and God's story with his people, okay? So it's integrated, telling the whole story of God. If you leave out one of the storylines of scripture, it's dishonest. It's just dishonest. Um, art, for example, is good, true, and beautiful. If you try to show everything through rose-colored glasses and leave out the fall, it ceases to be true. Okay? Now, I'm not saying we like it. I'm not saying we embrace it. I'm not saying that we receive it. But we have to be honest about it. This is why um, when you look at a Thomas Kincaid painting, and it camps out in the restoration, you feel like something funny is going on, something fanciful, right? Come on, this something's not right here. And it's not, it's an incomplete story. It's telling a piece of it, okay? It's important to realize when you're looking at the word of God. All right, so to the Jew, there's an emphasis on consistent behavior, I just missed one, that belief is a verb, something you do, versus belief is a creed, something that you say. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I mean, if we just live the creed, what a boring life. Okay, but if we apply the creed, you know, to real life, it becomes adventurous, right? So we're not just creedal people, we do the faith. Belief is a verb. To the Jew, the emphasis is on consistent behavior. And to the Greek, it's more about ideas. So are you behaving consistently with your beliefs? Or are you just camping out on fanciful ideas? Now, this one is huge. This one gets really, really big in scripture. And just this sheet alone is going to be like a secret decoder ring to your entire Bible. Just this, if you could just understand this one sheet, the bottom is going to drop out of your Bible. I promise. Watch this. Community to the Jew. Community is more important than the individual. Sacrifice of personal rights for the benefit of the community. Versus the Greek ideal, the individual is more important than the community. Sacrifice community or harmony for the sake of your own personal interests. Now, let me just apply this real quick to a well-known parable you might know. The parable of the prodigal God. I mean, the parable of the prodigal sons. Oh, I mean, the parable of the prodigal son. You might know it. The father says, my son who has been lost is now found. Put the best robe on him. Put, the best, put, put a ring on his finger. Most likely the father's signet ring. The father's robe is the best robe. And slaughter the fatted calves. You know the story well. Let's apply this to the, just this last point to the prodigal son. You ready? The community is more important than the individual. And the Greek mindset, the individual is more important. Was the son acting more Greek or Hebrew when he left his father's house? Greek. Yeah. And where did he go? To a far off country. Where is a far country? Well, if you're looking at a map, you're looking at the Sea of Galilee, and if you look to the right, which is east, and a little bit south, there's a place called the Decapolis, Deca meaning 10, 10 cities. And that is Gentile territory. They're raising pigs there. I hear rumor of a demon-possessed man chained up to tombs over there that cries out lying day and cuts himself with stones. You've heard of the place? Just to the north is Capernaum, where Jesus tells the account of the prodigal son. It's a Jewish town. There's a synagogue there. Also, 
north and east, right above the Decapolis, is Chorazin and Bethsaida. Jesus had some bad words to say about that place. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, if you're a little Jewish boy growing up in a little Jewish town with a synagogue called Capernaum, and the east winds were to blow at night, the Sea of Galilee is seven miles across, 15 miles long, and it would blow smells of barbecued pig and the sounds of revelry coming from the 10 cities over the Lake of Genesaret or the Sea of Galilee to your little town. And that thing would beckon you all through your adolescence and developmental years. So when he squanders his father's, his inheritance from his father and he goes to a far country, that's where he's going. Whatever happens in the Decapolis stays in the Decapolis, <laughs> unless, of course, it comes back. Okay. So when the boy returns, hear what is said. Let us slaughter the fatted calf, for my son who is lost is now found. What is the father doing? He's celebrating. He's celebrating, but it's more than that. He's restoring. The son has dishonored the father in the community. So when the son returns, he not only has to restore the son to the household, but he has to restore the son to the community. Hear, hear the account of the, of the older brother. I've been with you this whole time. You never even gave me a little goat to celebrate with my friends. There's your context. How much will a goat feed you and a bunch of your friends? Slaughter the fatted calf. How many people will the fatted calf feed? Well, apparently you, your household, all your servants, and the whole village. Because if you're going to kill it, you better eat it because there is no refrigeration. You with me? He's restoring the boy back to the community because it's not about the individual. It's about the community. Okay? Here we go. We're going to do that with Luke, too, by the way. We just did it. We just did it with this account of the prodigal sons in Luke chapter 15. So we just made an application from Luke's gospel. All the Gentiles would understand um, would understand the Decapolis and what's there and where this boy went and so with the Jews. So we just applied this page to one of the most famous parables in all of the scripture. The other one we studied on Sunday morning, you can see that on our YouTube channel. We studied uh, the Good Samaritan, remember that? Okay. Good. I'm trying to remember it. I preached it. Uh, it was just Sunday. It was like a week ago, didn't it? Um, but yes, the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Sons. By the way, both sons are prodigal. That's why I made the joke. One wants his father's stuff by doing everything right. One wants his father's stuff by taking it and running with it because he thinks he knows better than his father. The older son is mad because now his younger brother that squandered his inheritance is not going to cut into his again. You see it? And by the way, the father is the God figure who girds up his loins and runs to his son. And Jewish law says, I can stone him because he dishonored me. But instead, this father girds up his loins, runs, and embraces him. This is why the father really needs to be reconciled to the whole community, too, because they're wondering about him. You let your son do that, man. That's why it could be, Tim Keller calls it prodigal God. That's why he writes a book called The Prodigal God. Because really, this is, this is God, God pouring out some grace and mercy where it doesn't deserve to be. Right? And that's all of us, by the way, recipients of that grace and mercy. All right, let's do it again. Again, the Jewish way of thinking is right doing. 
Um, the Greek way of thinking is right. Thank you. Let's do it again with another count. What about this one? You ready for it? Um, Jesus tells a parable. There were a man, there's a man who had two sons. He comes to one son and he says to his son, son, you work in my vineyard. And he says, I will. And then he comes to his other son and he says, son, work in my vineyard. And he said, I will not. And in the end, the one who said, I will, did not. And the one who said, I will not, did. And then the question is asked, which one of these sons did the will of the father? Well, which one? Second one. Second one. The one who said, I will not, but did. Why? Because to the Jewish people, doing is more important than what you say. See, we, we have all the right answers. Anybody here besides me have all the right answers? <laughs> oh, I have them. My grandmother said that to me one day. She looked at me and she said, you just have an answer for everything, don't you? <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> I do have an answer for everything. Now that you say it, I do. Talk myself out of a paper bag. Talk a dog off a meat truck. Yes, I have an answer for everything. And your response should be, so what? So what? So the Jewish person is not impressed with your answers. They're impressed with your life. And Jesus is Jewish, by the way. Did I make that point enough that Jesus is Jewish? <laughs> so if you want to understand Jesus, you must understand a Jewish or Hebrew way of thinking, right? Have to, not must, just, just, you just have to. If you want to understand the book, you have to understand it, okay? The moment, the, the more we can immerse our, ourselves into a Jewish way of thinking, the more about the Bible you will understand. And, and you may notice already in every sermon I've given already at Shepherd's Heart Anglican Church, we go there, don't we? Don't you hear it in every message so far? I hope you do. If you don't, I'm not doing enough homework, shame on me. I should take you there always, take you into the context always, because it's there that we get the transformation, okay? Because if we can understand what's going on, we give the Holy Spirit more to work with. I'll just need the Holy Spirit in my Bible. We also need a commentary and some prayer and some study time. Give the Holy Spirit something to work with. I'm not saying he can't supernaturally dump it into your brain. I'm just saying he's, it's going to be a lot easier for him and you if you just study it, you know, just a little bit. That's where, that's where we go. All right. So a Jewish person willingly submits to his rabbi's authority. Um, the Greek is submissive to no one. He values his independence. Me, myself, and I. I am my own authority. That's why when the preacher gets to meddling, the Greek goes to another church. <laughs> They're not submissive to the rabbi. That's where church hopping comes from. We don't have any allegiance to rabbi. Okay. Okay, so a Hebrew will submit to the rabbi's interpretation. Oh, this is good. This is good. A lawyer went to test Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what the, does the law say? Oh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 10. It's the beginning of our scripture reading on Sunday. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And the lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? Notice how Jesus asked the question, what does the law say, comma, how do you read it? If Jesus were the man's rabbi, he would have said, I don't know, how do you read it? You see the difference? Oh, well, let me tell you how I read it. And then he reiterates the Shema. 
but how you read it is not what does it say, it's how do you apply it. You see the difference? Which is why the follow-up question is, well, who is my neighbor? It's actually a, a receptive posture. I'm just saying he might not like the answer because then comes the good Samaritan, the Samaritan's a hero. Okay. And again, to a Jew, we're thinking like Jews here, the enemy's the hero? Because I don't like that. But notice the questions and the banter in scripture because it gives you insight into the culture. We're going to do this again in two weeks. Um, we're, well, we're going to do it again next week. This coming week with Mary and Martha, we're going to talk about cultural hospitality and reciprocity. But in two weeks, we're going to talk about prayer. There's a man in his house and his friend comes at midnight and all of us Westerners say, why are you knocking on my door at midnight? <laughs> you know, but to the Jew, it's, ah, of course your friend came at midnight. It's too hot to travel during the day. We all try to tra travel at night. And of course, your friend rose up and gave you bread. Because what happens if I have friends at midnight and I don't have bread? Guess whose door I'm knocking on? Schmitty's. So of course, Schmitty's going to come give me bread. Because if he needs it, he's going to knock on my door. And I'm going to have to give Schmitty bread at midnight. This is what we do in the first century. We give each other bread at midnight when travelers don't. But again, if we think like us, it's not going to make any sense. But if we think like them, it's going to make perfect sense. Is that fun? Is that fun for anybody else? Have you ever seen it that way? Okay, good. All right. So, willing to wrestle with the text for long periods of time. Um, preferences for quick, simplistic answers. Didn't I come to Tuesday night Bible study? Shouldn't that be enough? <laughs> right? And instead of let's take it. I, I remember I did a Bible study with a little church plant. I was helping lead. And we studied Luke chapter 7 for five months. Weekly. And the guys were like, really? We're going to study this passage again? Yes. <laughs> it was, I don't think I had the patience to do it again, but we did it. We did it um, for a very long time. The Jewish person is more willing to wrestle with the text for a longer period of time. Focus on developing discernment where the Greeks have a lack of critical thinking skills. So to the Greek, just give me a bunch of information and tell me what the right answer is. Is this going to be on the test? But to the Hebrew, it's how do you think critically? And how do I wrestle with this and have discernment? Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Memorizing their scriptures. I'll just Google it. <laughs> the Greek says, I'll just Google it. <laughs> Right, the Greek doesn't need to memorize it because he can ask his Apple Watch, Siri, what does, and yeah. Okay. So the Hebrews memorize their scriptures. This is why when Satan tempts Jesus in Luke chapter four and Matthew chapter four, what is Satan's trick? Twist things. Miscloaked scripture. What is Jesus's trick? Correctly, yeah, correctly interpret scripture, right? Because he's got it in his mind and he knows when the devil's messing with him, right? That's what the Jewish person does. He commits, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. That's good. Okay, life in community. And to the Greek, functional long, lone rangers. So life is communal versus functional lone rangers. I mean, that that is how adolescent boys learned about sexuality in the household as the entire household lived together in multi-generations. 
or um, you get this dinner TV where young men would climb up to the roof of their home, look down into the courtyards of other homes and watch how dinner, dinner parties are thrown and who interacts with who and how do we relate to one another. And oh, oh, you think gossip travels fast in a small church? Oh, in a little Jewish village? Everybody knew everybody's business all the time. Let me just throw this one out at you. What about the woman with the issue of blood? Have you ever thought about her? And she snuck up on Jesus and touched the tassel of his robe, thinking if I just touch him, I'll be made healed, I'll be made well. Number one, why does she sneak up on him? Number two, why does she just touch his robe? And number three, why does she not to want to be noticed? Now I ask you another set of questions. Why does Jesus stop? Why does Jesus call her out and publicly shame her? Because that's what I feel like he's doing as a Westerner. And why does he make a big deal about it so that everybody knows? Because this woman in a small community with an issue of blood for 12 years literally has her dirty, dirty laundry hanging on the line. Okay. So that makes her impure in the Jewish culture. It also means she can't, she can't um, give birth to a male heir to take care of her. She's not going to get a husband because she cannot conceive and give birth to a male heir. And so for 12 years, she's alone and she's shamed and she can't get right with God because of her constant state of impurity. She touches his tassel because she doesn't want to touch him and make him impure. She sneaks up on him. He calls her out. You got an idea? Go for it. March. I never thought about his shaming her. I always thought he was honoring her and oh, her faith. It's even better. He's not only not shaming her publicly. He's not only honoring her condition and the fact that he's just healed her. I felt power go out for me. He is restoring her back to her life. So in other words, if everybody knows she's in a constant state of impurity, if he makes a big deal about the fact that she's healed, now everybody knows in seven days and after she goes to the mikvah, she'll be pure and ready. Well, that took awesome. a lot of that took a lot of faith and a lot of courage for her to do that. And, well, she, and I always thought Jesus honored that because he knew it was in her heart. And so he honored her by healing her. By and and by gently calling her out. It wasn't gentle, it was a public spectacle. And he did and he honored her by doing it. Because again, if everybody knew she was impure, everybody needed, needed to know she was made holy. She, he was giving her her life back. Because her dirty laundry was hanging on the line for 12 years, he is now saying the slate has been made clean. So the tax collectors should have been taking notes on that. And the Pharisees, when they criticized the tax collectors, because he said, I came, you know, those who aren't sick don't need a physician. Yeah. And there's case in point, because I just healed this person, you see. And Luke, the physician, Tells us the details about all these sick people that Jesus is healing throughout his gospel. And that's the other thing we talked about last week is the uniqueness to Luke giving us that medical attention. All right, let's get rolling because we'll never get a handout too. We'll have to do that next week. All right, so uh, does life in community is what we were just talking about. So if you're sick in community, you need to be restored communally. It's not about the individual, it's about the whole. Life is integrated. We live holistic lives. I'm going to rail on this one a little bit. Um, life into the Greek is, is, um, is dichotomized or siloed. There's a division between the sacred and the secular. I have a problem with our 21st century Christianity because I believe that we silo our faith and we we are disintegrated people. 
when God wants us to be integrated, okay? Whole people. In other words, mind, body, spirit, sex, food, recreation, fun, pleasure, church, prayer, all together now. You know? So you worship when you go out to eat and you have a great meal. Is that, a, is that worship or do you only worship at church? When you create something, write something, do your work when you work. Are you glorifying God in your work? Or is work something you do because you have to, and then I go to church, and that's what I do to worship? That's a huge problem. And it's a problem everywhere. I see it everywhere. And, and it's Gnostic, which is an, it, which is an old heresy that says that um, we're just all spiritual beings trapped in this physical body. And if we just escape this physical body, we'll be okay. It's escapism. So in other words, this world has fallen and it's all bad and sad, and we just need to get out. No, no. God will have this world restored, okay? What happens to me when I die? The restoration of all things. Jesus says, behold, I make all things new, including your body, everything. We should not and must not dehumanize our faith. We must not silo or compartmentalize our faith. That's why I don't like Thomas Kincaid. I'm sorry I was railing on that guy because it's all restoration and it feels dishonest to me because you're really not giving me a whole picture um, of, of life. You're giving me this, this fantasy. But Jesus is in the dirt with us. Jesus comes down here. Jesus uh, smells like his sheep. It's gritty. Our faith is gritty. Our relationship with Jesus is gritty, at least this side of, of heaven. But I think Thomas Kincaid is painting restoration. And for that, I am grateful for him. But if he's giving us an accurate picture of what is or thinks he is or how it should be without the realistic piece, it could be dishonest. And I, I think that we have to uh, get in the dirt a little bit. Yes, Paul. Well, I'm just some ins Reverend. I have one inspiring insight. So, so in the aspect of freedom of faith, I see that that's what reminds me. Like the lifestyle of underground believers is more holistic, mm -hmm. integrated, because they rely on God yeah. at any moment. Because yeah. they know at any moment they may be their last time, moment on the earth to encounter with the Lord in His glory. But in contrast, I see that in the religious freedom, there is more tendency of the total separation, as you as you point out. So, because they believe that there is time of freedom, yeah. or there is time for sacredness. But I'm gonna repeat this for the recording. Yeah, we never know what will happen even after a moment. Yeah. So the persecuted church or the underground church has a more integrated faith because they rely on God for for everything. Yeah. And really, we should but we don't always because uh, really we think we're, we, we learned enough. We know enough. We might be smarter than God. That's a Gnostic idea. If I can know enough, I can save myself. If we just had the right technology or healthcare, we'll live forever. If I just had enough access to, you know, whatever it is, you know, money, power, healthcare, you know, I can, I can, you know, preserve my body into everlasting life. And it's just not true. That's a Gnostic idea that we can somehow save ourselves um, or that we just need to escape this physicality and we do it by more knowledge. So it's not integrated and it's not holistic. Look for it everywhere, you'll find it. So to the Jew, it's a desire to be a disciple and to the Greek, oh, just believe in Jesus. Oh, just believe. Well, that's easy. But do you want to follow him when you don't believe or when you doubt? I believe, I believe, I help my unbelief. And Jesus says, oh, that's the kind of faith I'm looking for because at least he's telling the truth. Do you want to believe? 
wherever you are. You know what I mean? Do you want to be a disciple? Because that's going to cost you. Remember, Jesus didn't tell us to make converts. And he told us to make disciples. <laughs> Go, therefore, and make converts of all nations, teaching them to believe me. And though I am with you always. No, no, no. Make disciples. And the right interpretation of that is, of course, you will be making disciples as you go along the way, because everybody is, you know, it's a disciple rabbi culture. All right, total surrender to the rabbi's authority and living. To the Greek, it's partial elective surrender to Jesus' authority, as it is convenient for me. As long as it doesn't inconvenience my life. But Paul, you're right. To the underground church, it, it means everything, all the time. Because if I don't rely on Jesus, I'm dead in the war, right? To the persecuted church. And once they're phone, they deliver their message. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to finish this handout and then we'll relegate the rest of the context. We've already done some good examples. So we've got the application. So to the Jew, we got three left. Nothing is hidden or off limits to the rabbinic scrutiny. Nothing is off limits to rabbinic scrutiny scrutiny you know what happens today if the pastor knocks on your door you didn't call or text first what are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> i won't do that to you by the way um because i because I'm, I'm considering my audience but we're north american christians it's rude not to call in advance or text or plan it out right but that just tells you where we are doesn't it just like when you, you hire somebody, uh, you know, if you ever want to get the house clean, just say we're going to hire somebody to clean the house. Everybody starts cleaning. Well, I don't want the person to know what I, what <laughs> I found my house is. <laughs> you know, is it just me? <laughs> Am I reading your mail? Um, nothing to the to the rat to the Jew. Nothing is off limits to rabbinic scrutiny. All right, but to us, much of our life is hidden from others. We live behind closed doors. We Push the garage door goes up. We park the car. The garage door goes down. We go in there. There's a comedian I used to love named James Gregory. He said, "What's wrong with America is we quit building front porches on houses. We went to the back deck." <laughs> yeah, it's comedy. It's kind of funny when you think about it, but there's truth in comedy, right? This idea that used to be people sat on their front porches and everybody was minding everybody's business and everybody was parenting everybody's kids. Now we're out in the back deck. We enter through the garage. Nobody sees anybody. Nobody, everybody said, right? That's just not how people lived in the time of Jesus. Full stop. That's just not how they lived. All right. So to the Jew, life issue oriented. Um, to the Greek, conceptually oriented. To the Jew, dialogue intensive. Let's talk about it. To the Greek, let the pastor stand up for an hour and do a Bible study on Luke, and we just don't talk to each other for a long time. Um, sorry for that. This is a very Greek thing we're doing right now. Focused on men is the, to the Jew, um, and then to the to the Greek, more men and women are being discipled. More women are actually being discipled. Than today's men. So, in other words, there's a feminization of even the church where men have abdicated their role. And I think it's sad, not because I don't believe women should be in leadership, because I do, um, but I think not to the expense of the men abdicating their, their roles. And I think it's tragic. So, we'll end there and I'll take uh, questions and comments. We've got, gosh, we did an after party. I'll stop the recording at eight. Um, 803, because I think we got late to start, but we did an after party that lasted about 20 minutes, and I'll stay here as long as you guys will. No, I'll, I'll stay here for about 30 minutes, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll cut us off. Okay, questions or comments, interactions with what we just did? Yes. I actually have a question about the Greeks having a lack of critical thinking skills okay. because of Plato and Socrates and all the great philosophers that we often point to. Yeah, again, aren't we siloing what thinking is? And aren't we siloing what critical thinking is? Mm -hmm. Because wisdom is applied knowledge. So I think that sometimes when we think critically thinking, we, we think book smart. And I think critical thinking is application and navigation 
of the complexities of knowledge and life as a whole. All right. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what uh, the author of this is getting at. Um, Doug Greenwald, Preserving Bible Times, is where this handout came from, by the way. Um, just for the recording, preservingbibletimes.org. Doug Greenwald um, is the author of the handout we just looked at. Your handout, your other handout has the website for Preserving Bible Times and more of this. And this was all used by permission from the organization Preserving the Bible. And I, I, I believe that some of these Hebrew life studies single to Asian. Say it again. Hebrew life studies single to Asian life studies. Hebrew life is it's similar to the Asian people. Is similar to the Asian people. Yes. yes. And one of the things we didn't even touch that I need to talk about in that regard is honor shame. Okay. The Asian culture is an honor shame culture. The Jewish culture is an honor shame culture. We don't live in an honor shame culture. So, in other words, discipline happens between honor shame. Your honor is everything. You honor people who are elder, older, older than you. You um, reverence people who are in authority. You never want to lose your honor. The individual children in the family carry the family's honor. The prodigal son dishonored their father, which bring, brought dishonor upon the household, which dishonored the father, his whole household in that village, which could have dishonored that village or that synagogue in the greater whole of Israel, right? Okay. I've got gray hair. Yes. I remember when that's the way we were raised. Yeah. yeah. That you were carrying the family name, so yes. you better... You better do what's right. That's and right. It changed but again, somewhere in the 60s or 70s. Don't do it for your sake. Do it for the family. Do it for the family's sake. Yeah. Don't dishonor mom and dad. Right. Well, we don't even care anymore because where is mom and dad? But, you know, 53% of Christian families are in divorce. You know, which family do you want me to honor? And if it's all about the individual, who cares about mom and dad? As long as I don't dishonor me. It will not go well for thee then. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is why honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. You might live in the land, the first commandment with a promise. To say that another way, how it was in my family, you better honor your mother. She will kill you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But yeah, honor shame is huge. And we're going to see that play out in the scripture. Matter of fact, we already have in Luke chapter 15, we see it playing out. Because that's our big example today was Luke 15. Yeah. And I was going to say that also plays into the pro choice culture of mm, what is best for me is the most important. Yeah. And everything, if you inconvenience me, then yeah. I can. Yeah, the pro life, pro choice debate. Listen to the mantra, my body, my choice. Uh -huh. I mean, that is, that is, I mean, in some churches, my church, my choice, my Jesus, my choice. I mean, you just hear the narcissism in it. You hear the individualism. You hear just the cut off, the inconsideration of your neighbor. Well, who is my neighbor? You hear that? Like, because nobody matters here but me. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Do you hear it? Mm -hmm. it, it it's it's navel gazing. Not what must we do to have life. My body, my choice doesn't think about the body within the body, doesn't think about the other person in the equation, does it? And even as Western Christians who are fairly conservative, committed, Bible-based, we think of ourselves as Christians. We don't think of ourselves as kingdom people. Where the kingdom has the emphasis of community on it, whereas the identity as Christian seems the more direct, me, God, me, Jesus, me to God, me to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's good. This is important stuff. 
And, and what we are talking about, what we're going to get at in the second handout next week is the context that we're speaking of. The, the next handout I gave you, if you want to read ahead, we're looking at historical context. So how was it back then? We're looking at literary form. What is this literature and how do we read it? Which we did last week when we talked about gospel. What is a gospel? Is it a letter because he's writing to Theophilus? Is it history? By the way, some scholars believe that it's the written case that went before Paul because Luke was with Paul as his physician. To say that again, in Acts, like a written case, like, like a, a, a law case that would be presented before the Roman authorities. Oh, oh on behalf of Paul. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was Luke in Acts. In other words, we're making our case here, which is why it's so thorough. So, what is the literary form, the linguistic? Technique. So, in other words, what is a parable? We're going to talk about this thing called a remez, which is a hearkening back. So, that's a fun thing we'll do. If I say happy birthday, birthday to <laughs> you, yeah, we finished the sentence. Why? Because we know that song. Yeah. That's a remez. So, the Jews did it all the time. Like Jesus from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's invoking all of Psalm 22. He's not just saying that because he's feel so far from God. No, no, no. He's invoking an entire song. So if you really want to know what he's saying, you got to go read the whole song. Isn't that fun? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Again, we got to think like they do. So linguistic techniques, uh, the Jewish village social, social customs, we were all over it tonight, weren't we? We talked okay. about the woman with the issue of blood. We talked about the prodigal sons. We talked about Mary and Martha, briefly, what else? We talked about the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. All of this is village cultural life. And so we're going to talk about these things in detail. We talked about leadership. We talked about the, a little bit about the Roman political backdrop. We're going to talk about geography. We talked a little bit about that already tonight. Remember the Decapolis? Mm -hmm. That is a geographical contextual piece that illuminates the, the parable of the prodigal sons. And if you didn't know that, you were just thinking that all of this was made up. A certain son went to some far off village. Yeah, that's general. But now you know we're talking about real places, right? So we're going to do this. We're already doing this oral culture, physical features of biblical sites, agrarian economy, agriculture, spatial proximities. And basically everything we're doing is in this color illustration right here. We're looking at the wheel of context. We're putting the text into its context. Other questions or comments? And those of you who need to go, Maria, thanks for joining us. All of you online, we've been together an hour. So I honor your time. You are dismissed. And I'll hang out as long as you want and ask questions, have conversation. Recording this will go. I really like that because, um, like I used to think the sun went to far off country. It was sort of a symbolism of he went away far from God, mm -hmm. but it seems it makes it even richer to yeah. know that geographical context. Well, if you consider the evangelical triangle of Galilee, Jesus spent 80% of his life teaching and ministry in what's called the evangelical triangle, which is basically the region of Galilee in the north. So he's from Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, as an adult made his hometown in Capernaum. That's life. That's it. He doesn't go anywhere. Now apply that to the part of the song. He went to a far off country. How far do you got to go to go to a far off country? Just right over there. <laughs> right over there in the Decapolis. Just right over there. That's all you got to do. Just cross that leg, cross that border, go over there. Now, now just apply this to, to Jesus, to his disciples. Let us go over to the other side. Let us go over to the other side.
That's code for the Decapolis. Where do they land? They land over there with the demoniac. What happens? A big storm arrives. Where does that storm come from? An east wind blows over a mountain. The cool desert air, because of the sunset, mixes with the warm Galilee waters, causes a storm. Jesus does not one thing, but two things. He rebukes the wind, and he says to the sea, peace be still. Why? Because it was thought that the evil came from over there, where those Gentiles were, in the east, in the far country. We also report that the Lord Jesus made some 12 years of his childhood in Egypt. Say it again. The Lord Jesus lived some short, some Amen. short years in Egypt in his childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like to, to flee from Herod the Great, he was in Egypt for yeah. a minute. Yeah. And the Coptic says that he lived in Cairo. They claim for yeah. we, sure. we don't know. A couple, couple <laughs> years tops, though. You know, between you know, stable one or two years. Yeah, and uh, and circumcision, which was eight days. Sorry. Wise men, which is a couple of years, anywhere from one to two years between Jesus and the wise men, Jesus being born in Bethlehem in a manger and the wise men coming. It was a good hiding place. Yeah. Because it, it'd be the last place you would look for a Jewish family. And also fulfills the Old Testament prophet out of Egypt, I call my son, right? Yes. I, you know, I'm stuck on this. It's still going. Yeah, we can come on. Thank you for joining us online. We're going to stop the recording and take some candid conversation here in the room. And God bless you guys. We will see you next time here at Shepherd's Heart Anglican Church. Check us out on our website and watch the previous recording, shacfairfax.org.